Let's get started. Let me pray for us. Um, Father, we're, we're grateful. I, I'm, I'm, all, I'm always grateful when I come here because I, I just see brothers and sisters who are, who are just into your word and, and want to grow and learn in this area. And I'm, I'm so impressed. Um, I thank you for the willingness to take Saturday mornings up to do this. And um, I pray that you you bless them, um, that in, in, in these words could be, could take root in their hearts, uh, becomes the basis of, of their life and faith and transformation. Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Um, so, the righteousness of God in the Old Testament, the story of his efforts to make things right. We talked about this last week. I tend to review a little bit. Uh, just make sure we we kind of remember all where we are and how we got start got, got to where we, we got to. Uh, the Bible in five acts, God creates heaven and earth and appoints human vice regents to rule the earth on his behalf. The human vice regents rebel against their liege, leading to chaos and corruption on earth. God calls into existence the kingdom of Israel as his tool to end rebellion and restore the rule on earth. As the kingdom join, joins the rebellion. God sends his son as the embodiment of faithful Israel and calls the church into existence as his tool to end rebellion and restore his rule on earth. And finally, God restores his rule on earth and renews all creation. This is your five-act story in the Bible. Um, the Old Testament is the first three acts, and New Testament is the second, the last two acts. So if we're going to talk about the Old Testament, we're going to focus on Act 2 and 3. But you can't just look at Act 2 and 3 without looking at Act 4 and 5. So we'll always be with an eye toward a, how does the story end, right? Because otherwise it's silly. Well, we're going to pretend we don't know that would just be silly. Okay. Um, I talked about the natural boundaries in the Old Testament canon. Primary history, Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, and so on and so forth. And I talked about how we cannot look at the whole Old Testament in 12, 12, 12 weeks together. It's just fall semester and spring semester. It's not going to be possible. I will focus my attention on primary history, Genesis through 2 Kings. A edited, edited work that spans from creation all the way to exile of Judah. One continuous story intended by the author, and I'm going to use that as kind of the main storyline of the Old Testament, to kind of the backbone. Uh, we will make references to prophetic literature, hymnic literature, um, that's pretty much it. Um, the other ones we will not have time to get to, not because they're not important, but just because I have to make some editorial choices. Um, unless you want a full on uh, um, class. And now we dive into primary history. This is Genesis to Second Kings. And we talk about it. There's a stru particular structure to it. The structure is two halves. Genesis 1 through 11 is being one half. And, and if you notice about the five acts of the, um, um, the Bible, the first two acts are contained in Genesis 1 through 11. This is the third act right here. Fourth and fifth in New Testament and Revelations. And it's Catholic. So your, your five-act story, it's, the proportions are off, if you will, in the Bible, okay? So we think conceptually, yeah, five acts, yeah, but the first two are right there. And then this third act is the whole rest of the story of the primary history, okay? And we talked about how um, this is a story, a story of failure, and we know it fails, and it's, or, it's almost ordained to failure, and we need to talk about why that is. What is, this, what is the meaning of such a story? Of the failure of the people of Israel and how it fails as a Scott's solution to the problem of human rebellion. Um, so you've seen this already. Um, I put this this slide up here to remind ourselves our basic reading um, um, assumptions, uh, inspiration and canon. This is the Word of God, and we believe that there is a canon. There's a set um, a set of books, and then we also argue for that there's three levels of reading, exegesis, canonical synthesis, and homiletics. And we'll be focusing on the one and two and let our pastoral friends work on homiletics. Even though I think I will jump into this every now and then because I feel like it. Okay, that's where we, we left off very hopefully. Um, not too, nothing too controversial there. Um, then we got into last week, creation and authority, the, the God's appointment of humans as vice regents. And unfortunately, we never got to that part. Uh, what we got stuck on is um, and this part, and I think this is, and I realized um, last time when I took, last week when I took this quick survey and asked how many people have, have looked at the form and fill understanding of Genesis 1, and I think only one person in the room has seen it before, so I'm going to stop here again and, and take more questions. And I'm sure there are lots and lots of questions about Genesis 1. Um, we, we, we started off talking about, you know, for example, what is the sun? If we're talking about exegesis, we're talking about reading things of historical context. What is the sun in the ancient time? What is the sun when, when, when Moses wrote, you know, if we're assuming Moses wrote it, uh, 
what does it mean to the ancient Israelites? What does sun mean? Um, versus jumping, let's say the Babylonian times. What did what did what did the sun? What did the moon mean in, in, in Babylon? In doing the Babylonian exile, um, and we talked about how um, these were gods, and that and that Genesis one was a story in which uh, which um, was really a pol polemic against other creation myths, other um, forms of, of systems of, of belief. So. I don't want to rehash the entire um, lecture, but I want to take questions. So I think this is a this is a big one. Um, I'll be doing something similar to this in the in the zoology um, lecture coming up, zoology 400. On uh, the, the the course Jeff Hart is running on on, on faith and evolution, the relationship between faith and evolution, and. Um, I think part of what, what, what motivates him to invite me is that I will talk about this, which will make him happy because, <laughs> because now what you have is, a, is that the Genesis 1 has really no real um, conflict with evolution, uh, ex oh, oh, except if you believe in naturalistic evolution. That's utterly unguided. If you believe in that, then there's a conflict. But Genesis 1 itself really is not about the how of creation. It is about God defeating the, uh, you know, the, 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 the de, de divinization, I guess, and taking them out of the godlike status of the natural world, establishing God as transcendent of the natural world, and showing God's organization and process of creation. Okay. Any questions on this? So God's dominance over the natural world would that be a oh, uh, Transcendence, perhaps. <laughs> dominance, dominance sounds so power driven. He rules over without a doubt. I mean, he, I mean his rule is absolute. But but I don't I don't see it as a as a rule out of malice. It's a rule out of joy and and, 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 and appreciation for the things he's created. In fact, you'll see in a bit, he's gonna do something rather unusual. He's gonna hand off power. He's gonna say something about our God. Okay. So that's that's coming up. Can I just say that yeah. uh, you know uh, last week when we did we talked about how you know uh, that there is a sense that uh, Ra is, is just a tiny little thing and our yeah. God is stronger than Ra. Right. Uh, I, 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 I could see that, but I mean, I'm not sure that that was the central polemic of it, but more in terms of everything else. Uh, I mean, some of the things they have their parts, they seem kind of limited. And right. uh, you know, when it rises in Egypt, it's probably set in somewhere else. So, in that sense, it's a very parochial cosmology, and this sounds like a much bigger. Well, they, they wouldn't know that the sun, when the sun rising in, in the it's east is it's setting, it's setting anywhere else. They would not know that. Mm -hmm. So, so, so they, so they live in a world that, in which you have earth, you have water above, you have the sky, and you have the sun in the sky, which is low. Okay, there's water above the sun. Would okay. they at least sort of realize the yeah. scandal that when, uh, you know, of course we could do that later today, that humans were created in God's image, yeah. that there is no parochialization there. Because yeah. I was talking to my mom the other day and she yeah. was talking about how uh, in, in the Indian uh, mythology mm -hmm. you already have in the creation mm -hmm. narrative different kinds of human beings. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's you're, you're absolutely, yeah. a scandal to say that the same people who worship Ra were also, are also somehow made in the image of the same God that the Israelites worship. Is that even... Uh, let, let's, get, let's get to that. Let's get, uh, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get to that. We'll, we'll, we'll focus on that exclusively. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I am loth to um, interpret... Um, I guess I, I, I would focus on historical context. And, and, and what, what the ancient narratives tell us again and again is how, I guess, enchanted the nature, natural world is. There's really no separation between the natural world and deities. Everything is a deity in, in, in the ancient world. So, I'm, ancient, I'm talking about the ancient world, I'm talking about um, before Christ in the, in, the, in the ancient Near East. Their worldview is there's a spiritual realm that is closely linked to the natural world and the earthly realm. Everything is about God or gods. So, in that sense, when you read this in light of, say, Enuma Elish or any of the Egyptian um, creation myths, so I, I guess I'm, I guess what I'm saying my controlling interpretive mode is we have creation stories. Here, here's the Hebrew contribution to the to the genre, and uh, in, they they must they're dialoguing based off a common motif such as creation out of chaos or creation out of a watery mess. So they're using the same language, yet 
this is distinctive. Okay, so I'm, I guess my interpretation is, is, is grounded on that distinction. M let's say Moses. Moses wrote this within a context, I guess not, possibly as far as 800 years later um, than our understanding when Numa Elish was at least coming to existence. Uh, it's a long history. Everybody knows Numa Elish in the ancient world. Um, and so when, when, when Moses does this, you can't help but compare. I think, I think the intended audience is expected to make comparison and go, whoa, check that out. So the contribution is that mm -hmm. creator and creation, I mean, that, that yeah. distinction rather than universal. And so that's something that we are reading into it rather than... Mm -hmm. than text well, I would say, look, I mean, he, he's saying that the, the, the Israel God transcends everything. It is the one God. And the other gods you think about are not gods at all, which gets into universalism, absolutely. You, you know, you're right. This, 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 it, it's kind of a, but it's an interesting um, um, dynamic. It's, it's, it's particular yet universal. The claim is that the Israel's God is the universal creation God. Okay, the one who created all the uni all, all creation. Well, then, what's why is he just the Israel's God? I mean, that question has to show up, right? And we'll get to. I think the story is going to answer that once you get to Abraham. When, what is the point of Israel? And then when you get to New Testament, it's really answered, which is the God of all people. Right, right, the, the particular versus the universal uh, elements um, are, is built into the very beginning of the storyline. You can't have just Israel's God if he's the creator God. He's got to want something for the rest of creation. So, but we'll get there. Okay, we'll get there. Any other questions on this? Okay. So everybody's good with this. Nobody's like, oh my gosh, okay, all right, that's fine. <laughs> Nobody's freaking out, everybody's like, okay, sure, sounds good. All right. People usually freak a little bit, so okay, I'm good. I'm gonna keep moving. We looked that quote last time. So I wanna focus today, uh, uh, as a beginning part, on this important part about appointing vice regents, which is actually kind of the main title of, of this, this the last week's lecture, which we never got to. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image and our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, and over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. And God created mankind in his own image, in the image of God he created them, male and female he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And this is this is kind of the critical section. This is actually the, the creation of humanity, and it helps us understand what humans are. And this is absolutely critical for, for understanding the rest of the Bible, because the rest of the Bible is a story of God and his interaction with humans. So what is the relationship? How are we to understand their relationship is one, one that's very critical. If you read Atrahasis, God creates humans because they need somebody to provide them food. So, so humans understand as slaves. Okay. That's a way of understanding humanity. Okay. Uh, here, we, we, we have a definition of humanity, of image. And um, some of you, if you heard the, 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 the sex talk I gave a number of years ago, we're going to have some very repeated um, material here. Um, I'm going to get into the, into the, into the word image, um, image of God. Now, when people see... Um, you know, well, that's mankind in our image. He made mankind his own image, an image of God. He created them, male, female. He created them. So, humanity is in the form of the image of God. Um, what does that mean? Well, before we answer that question, um, the image has function. So we have form and function. The, the form is image. The function is so that they may rule. All right. So image and rulership seem to be related. Right? So that they, in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over the livestock, and, and so on and so forth. And rule over the, so once again, be fruitful, multiply, rule over the fish in the sea, birds in the sky, and over the living creature that moves on the ground. So what we have here is a, 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 a definition of the form of humans and their function in life. And the question for us is, how do these two things fit together? The you will hear a lot of discussion on imago dei, Latin word for image of God. Um, I'm not going to go there at all because once you go Latin, all kinds of things get imported into this concept. And um, so when I do it to Jesus, we, we stick with original language. And I want to rather do Tselem Elohim, which is the word image of God in Hebrew, which for some reason feels very different. And 
reads differently than Imago Dei, and I'm, I'm not going to comment on Imago Dei beyond that. Um, this is the word Tellum, um, uh, um, the word for image. Um, if you look at this S, the dot, so it's, instead of Selim, it's t the T S L Tellum, accent on the first syllable. That's your segla, Rick. <laughs> Now, tell him it's a physical representation of something else. Just real quick minor question. Yes. When you, when Hebrews put that way, do we read it left to right or right to left? Uh, right to left. So you see the Hebrew goes that way. It's always going to go right to it's left. It's always going to go right to left, yeah. Okay. But, but, but the transliteration goes left to right. Okay. Otherwise, people get confused. So it, you don't read melats, you read tell him. <laughs> Tell him. Yes. But fine. Let's talk about this. <laughs> so this is the tadhe, this is the lam, and this is the mem. Okay? The ta la ma. And is that, is that, you talked about that a little bit last week. The yeah. Three consonants together is a common. It's a common Semitic, uh, Semitic um, 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 a form. You use three consonants and you vary the vowels in between them for the, for the pattern. And how do you know what the vowels are? Uh, the dots, the three little dots on the bottom, those are sigils. They're e short E sounds. <laughs> Oh, sounds. Good. You see those yeah, dots, dots, you read, so you don't read across, you read down, then up, and down like this. Because you see consonant, then vowel. Consonant, vowel, consonant, vowel, consonant. Right. Yeah. Kind of in the same writing system, actually. <laughs> uh, there's a reason why it's like that, but we won't get into it. Uh, okay, so tell them. Tell them is a physical representation of something else. If you look at Biblical Hebrew, it's used 13 times uh, apart from this, pas these pas this passage. And it's always in reference to an idol or a figurine or a carved image. In Biblical Aramaic, it shows up 15 times in Daniel, always referencing that big statue in the, in the book of Daniel. Akkadian cognates statue of a god, a king, or a statue in general, a figurine, a relief, etc. This is a tell -em. This is a tell of a person. You will find this in... Um, University of Chicago's um, um, uh, Oriental Institute, uh, Institute the Museum, and um, they call him the little priest because he um, represents a person. And this is how it works, okay? Uh, you have a temple, and ideally you want to go to the temple and pray a lot, and to worship the gods who are there, who are represented by their temple sitting there. And so what this man had did is he he made an image of himself and made a telem of himself in prayer, see? And they stuck it in the temple to worship the telem of the God. So now he can go and do other things, but he is now always worshiping God because the telem represents him. So it's, yeah, it's kind of quite impressive actually. Um, how this works. Would everybody do that? If you have time and money, I suppose, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, now I am constantly in prayer. They call him the most devout man in the Asian, the Asian world because <laughs> he's 24 7 in front of his God. Quite impressive. And, and by saying that, I'm saying that a tellum represents the essential characteristic of a being and it represents the power and presence or authority of a being. So, how this works is let's say I'm an emperor. And you're one of my vassals. Now the problem, of course, is no Skype, no email, no telephone, is that you're gonna be 500 miles away running one of my little fiefdoms, okay? And you, you, know, you run things your way, and as long as you send me taxes, money, we're good. But how do I represent my authority in your court? Well, what happens is I make a tell them of myself and stick it in your palace, okay? And then you go, the wake up in the morning, oh, there's Emperor so-and-so. Pay obeisance, okay, everybody realizes that you have an emperor above you. Okay, you're representing the emperor in your role. Okay. So that tellum represents um, um, power, presence, authority of a being. Now when I when I went to China um, last December to teach a bunch of pastors, and I was getting trying to come do this those concepts, they totally get what I was saying. They just boom, they got it, and this is what they showed. They actually gave me this picture. <laughs> okay, they said they gave me this one. Say, like, hey, apparently now this is what they tell me. So if I'm wrong about China, you know this is they put the me. There's four cities that, that are ruled directly from Beijing by the, by the by the federal government. They're directly administered. Apparently, four districts, city cities that are that are like on the prov on the provincial level. Okay, five. Uh, five. Beijing. Beijing is four. Beijing, Chongqing, Tianjin, and Shanghai. I'm actually correct on this. I wouldn't know the name of those, but I knew there was four. So in those four, there's the statue that kind of, this is representing the direct rule of Mao Zedong. It's like, this is, this is kind of his relationship. Um, you know, when I grew up in Taiwan, you know, we walked to the classroom and there was a picture of Chiang Kai-shek on the, on, the, on the classroom. You know, you're supposed to, you know. You know. And now, now if, okay, now here's a question. 
If you knock down the statue, what are you doing? You're rebelling. You're rebelling. Absolutely. Symbolic act, okay? That's in Iraq, right? That's what they did in Iraq. Mm -hmm. they, the first thing they did, they tore down the statue of, Osama, of, of Saddam Hussein. Right? You understand symbolic act. This is power and symbol and representation, and you knock, did knock it down to, to represent your rebellion against this guy's rule. Okay? So I just want to kind of get this idea concept across about how Tillam is really related to power, authority, and representation. Um, let me go a little further. Um, this is a Tillam of a god. Not Tillam of our god, but Tillam of a god. This happens to be Baal, um, the, the Canaanite god. Um, now, by the way, in the ancient world, nobody thinks that Baal actually looks like this. But when I say representation, I don't mean I don't mean realistic depiction. What I mean by that is, it's iconography. The the things that is portrayed reveals essential characteristics of that god. So, he has a spear with tails that looks like a thunderbolt. He is a storm god, and this is his main weapon. He is a storm god. He has a sword. Powerful warrior god. He fights. He can take on other gods. He's powerful. Uh, long beard, which today would be like decrepit and old, but in ancient world represents wisdom and you know longevity. Old is actually what's respected in the ancient world. So you look at this image and think, oh, so this is saying something about Baal, okay? Any questions on this? Okay. So. This is an image of our God. Actually, this is an image of an image of our God. The image of our God actually here. Look around, right? Humans are created in the image of God. Okay? Um, when I give this talk, I usually tell people to go and go home and, you know, take a sh before you take a shower, look in the mirror. All right, just look at your body. Okay? Um, your body represents God's essential characters. If you have eyes, God can see. If you have nose, God can smell. If you have mouth, God can speak. If you have arms and manipulate things, God can move things. You have emotions, God feels. You think and are rational, God thinks. You are much greater than you can even imagine. Your entire being is a representation of God's essential characteristics. Obviously limited. Nobody says God looks like you. Okay, that's not, not, nobody's thinking that. Which we would look at a person and we go, oh, well, that God has those essential qualities represented by the human body, by the psychosomatic unity of the body. So I think that really resolves our, you know, I think with, with that discourse, I think we're, we're, we're doing pretty well in terms of understanding image. Humanity in the form of image of God, it represents the being and it represents the being to creation. Right? We represent God, we have God's creativity, we have God's insight, intelligence, and, 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 and empathy, to, um, uh, ways to manipulate things, to communicate, and we have all that so that we can rule. All of that is given so that we have rule over the earth. And that is kind of the, the big payoff here. Humans represent God's rule over the earth. Humans are vice regents, appointed by God. God is the emperor, and he hands the humans a right to rule as part, the part, a part of his creation. That tells you something about who God is. He's a person who likes to share power, which is interesting in of itself, but also something about who we are. And that understanding, right, right at the smack that beginning of Genesis 1, sets the stage for understanding everything else in the Bible. Okay. That's critical to understanding who we are. Uh, do we know where verse 27 comes from? Is that a quote? Is that a song? Is that, you know, it's like, like, like separated from the other? Okay, so let's just, let's just get it straight, okay? Um, in the original Hebrew, there's no such versification. It, okay. it just, it's, it's joined together. Right. The reason uh, uh, your NIV translator and your English translator do this is they're thinking, oh, that looks poetic. Because mm. we have 
may be a bit of parallelism going on. So whenever they see possible poetic lines, they will turn it into stanza form. So that's it. That's the decision of the English translator. Does, does that mean, and sometimes I've heard that that means that they think that that poem may have originated before the main text? That uh, not necessarily. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. They will do anything that's poetic. They will put it's it in that form. Poetic, put in that form, it just means it's poetic. It's poetic. But some people will say, well, does this, occur, is, does this, have, does this have a pre-life before it showed up here? Once again, remember last week's discussion about our discussion about <coughs> problem of textual composition and the lack of evidence. Micah? There's not even punctuation in Hebrew, right? Um, not until much later. <laughs> and the punctuation is not what we call punctuation. It's, it looks very different. So the text just goes? Well, no, when, well, it does have versification. It breaks into verses. Okay. And, and the versification are fairly early. Um, you can actually see the division in our earliest manuscripts right now. Um, you yeah. said the earliest complete version is, is from 1000? 1000 AD, yeah. 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 But you will see some, some kind of division even in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Our versification or separate from? You mean the verses here on these ones? Yeah. Um, is that adopted from the scrolls? Well, it's, it's adopted from the scrolls, but there are places <laughs> where in which the English chapter and verse differs from Hebrew Bible chapter and verse. Um, that does happen. So, and that's, we, we adopted a chapter and verse system from some bishop, shoot, what is his name? Ninth century? Shoot, AD. So he, he, he went ahead and put in chapter numbers and verse numbers and all of these things. And the original Hebrew Bible didn't have chapter numbers and verse numbers. So, okay. Um, so, let me, let me just kind of pound this idea home a bit about who we are, because this is actually critical for understanding the, the, the rest of Old Testament and the New Testament. Yes. The question: When uh, God used that word "us," mm -hmm. I heard you talking about before. What does that mean? "Us" means. Good question. Um, now, there's multiple possibilities. Um, one is the one is the royal we, kind of like the, the British. The Queen says, "We are not amused." She just means I'm not amused, but she says <laughs> we're not amused because she's the Queen of England. Um, so there are people argue that there's kind of a royal we idea in the Hebrew Bible, and there's no evidence of such a thing. <laughs> so, okay, that's not, not very likely. Uh, two, I would say two arguments are, are very plausible, one slightly more than the other. Um, the traditional reading has been that this is a reference to the Trinity. Um, I find no evidence of Trinity in this text, or really, indeed, in the rest of the Old Testament. There's just, there's just that idea is not developed. Um, very well, um, not explicitly. Um, whereas the idea of God, especially God speaking in a divine court, you find, for example, beginning of Isaiah, beginning of Job, you find in Second Kings twenty-two. Uh, you have these. Uh, was it First Kings twenty-two? First Kings twenty-two. Um, these passages that are all about God, kind of God's a, God's an emperor, and he has courtiers, all kind of angelic beings sitting there. And he's talking to them, and they're having, they're, they're, they're discussing. That's a very common motif in the Old Testament. So I would lean toward, at least when it was originally written, toward a, in a divine court and reading of this passage. However, I would say, given that we have a canonical synthesis, we have the canon, and we have now the idea of Trinity in the New Testament very prominently. Um, it moves it. It tips the balance a little bit toward that direction, um, but so I wouldn't say no. That's a wrong reading. I'm just saying, you know, I, if I want to focus on exegesis, like what the original author would have referred to, I would I would go with divine court. Um, but if I'm saying, okay, I want to focus more on canonical synthesis, I would say maybe be beyond the knowledge of the original author, we're getting at some kind of trinitarian um, understanding. But I wouldn't push too hard on that. I've asked this before. I've heard the, the idea that. God is plural at times to represent His greatness. Yeah, I think that's one of the, uh, the that's one of the arguments for um, the, pr the the fundamental problem is the Elohim. The word Elohim is actually a plural form, which means it tra the word Elohim translates God or gods. The im ending is a plural ending. So you think, well, how do you know that's gods or God? Well, the context tells you. For example, here, God, then God said, "There's Elohim right there." What if it's God's said? Well, actually, you know it's not because the word said is singular. 
sorry, that's English, I know. In Hebrew, it's singular. So because it's matched with a singular verb, you know it's just God. But if it's matched with a plural verb, then you know it's God's. So, so it means both of them, plural and singular, depending on the context. Um, yeah, the word can. But it can't. But it doesn't mean both at any at the same time. I see. Well, you have to make a choice. Either. Yeah, it's either or. You cannot. It cannot be both. So why wouldn't Elohim be God, the great God? Said? And so some people make that argument, which should get you the whole royal we idea that the now Elohim God is re is used as a plural noun because of his greatness. Right. Uh not convinced. Not convinced. There's no real great evidence of that. But when we do grammatical arguments like that, we need to see. Um, things that work out that way. For example, panim, face. Plural ending. Does it mean great face? Like when you see other nouns that have, that s other singular nouns that have plural endings. Like your face, panim. Why is that, why is my, why is everybody's face so great? You know what I'm saying? So if you look, if you see that, if you see that occurring consistently okay. in reference to great things, then we can make that argument. But you can't just pull down one thing out and go, oh, it's plural noun, therefore. And okay, well, how do you know that? Well, look at, let's look at all the other instances where you have in ending applied using the only as a singular noun. Mm -hmm. okay. you and then you look for you look at face, you're going, that's ah, not there, sorry. Mm -hmm. Like Shemayim. Shemayim is a dual noun, dual form, <laughs> it's a heaven. Mayim, water. Mayim is dual form. Why is water, you know, so so there's not. There's no. There's nothing. Heaven there. could be great, right? Heaven could be great. Heaven could be great, but what about the water? Water could be great too, but face doesn't seem that great. Face doesn't seem that great. Yeah, there we go. See, see the problem of facing. As, as as we're doing things like this, we realize uh, there's just not much there. So it, it, I think it makes a good, you know, a sermon point. If somebody will come on and say, "Yeah, Elohim is really plural, great greatness of God," and then, but then, you know, yeah, okay, let's move on. So. It's good. I think you, you, what, you, what you're training us is that people have asked some good. There are some good logical questions you can use to look at. Right. When, when people make an argument, you can assess the data and say, "Okay, now, does em ending communicate that?" That's that's a question you can ask. So, and, and we can go and look those things up. Good. Does the same like any rule to be understand what they meant by rule? Um. So yeah. So this is interesting. Um. And I know there's this passage causes all kinds of problems because this is this is a and and the, and, and, and you know people actually talked about this and I I had um, one of my, when I taught this to a to a, a you know geology professor he's a, a Sam Kong he's at he's at the geology department and he's like subdue it that sounds so violent that sounds so and and um, is that what it really means and I go I looked it up and all of the usages it actually does mean that there is a sense of which humans are kind of establishing rule and then controlling it and and I know that really going against the zeitgeist of our time at least in our in the academic world um, and I know that this passage gets abused to justify all kinds of abuse of creation and and, and that's highly unfortunate I don't think it has to do so um, what it does do is to establish humans as transcendent over nature um, but I, I've always kind of argued, and, and this is kind of hard, um, that only by having Earth being transcendent is there is a foundational basis for sound environmentalism. I think this is my belief. Um, or you can watch C.K. Uh, Lewis C.K.'s uh, rant on this, um, rather X-rated uh, rant on. He he had the same result. He says, I don't understand evangelical Christians who. Um, who who believe that God created the creation and gave it to humans and then don't support environmentalism? Mm -hmm. And he just goes off on it, you know, like what you do to the polar bear? They're brown. Did you like bleep all over it? You know that kind of stuff. And he just goes off. And I think he's and thinks he's absolutely right. That if we are to rule over this, then we're responsible for it. We're responsible for fixing it and taking care of it. Um, so I, I strong so. I don't think we need to become part of creation in order to, to appreciate it. Indeed. It's kind of weird to think that being part of creation means we would appreciate it. It's actually because we transcend it that we actually feel the need to do more for it. But that's, but yeah, I, I'm not able to um, lessen the, 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 the scandal of that verse here. Um, 
<laughs> and one, one approach, you know, is yeah. just to think about it in terms of our understanding of God. Mm -hmm. Like, if we're appointed as rulers, then yeah. we are to rule as God rules. Yes. With humility yes. and justice and a, yeah. an aim toward making the world. Well, right. well, she, this is where this is where I think it's really interesting is that um, once you get to the uh, end of Genesis. And, and I know I'm sure we're actually going to talk about this in the class. The, the definition of kingship is self-sacrifice. Mm -hmm. okay. So the thing is, we use these words, but Bible is going to infuse them with a different meaning. The self-sacrifice is the definition. It's the qualification of kingship. If that is the case, I actually I brought this up in a discussion uh, on campus on, on this issue, and I said, look, if, if a mosquito is sucking, sucking my blood, do I need to sacrifice myself for the mosquito? <laughs> And I said, no, I'm going to kill that mosquito, Dave. <laughs> I am not sanctified yet. <laughs> but that's kind of what it's getting at. But that if, as Christ sacrificially died for his people, thereby, thereby being, becoming the Messiah, the king, the king um, our rule is, is marked by self-sacrifice. Is to care so much for the, what we rule over that we, 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 we stand under it to serve it, to serve the creator more. Is that basically available? for people at that time because I know that there are other myths where the king actually has to die after a certain time to renew his people. Um, Would they have access to that sort of thinking? No, which is why I think Genesis is rather surprising. Uh, kings don't usually die for anybody. <laughs> That's really not how it works. Um, not in the ancient world. So in fact, if you want to talk about contrast, um, here's, here's Esther Haddon, the king of Assyria. And this is what he said. He said a free man is as the shadow of God. So, so the hu human society is divided into three layers. You're talking about this issue of universalism. Uh, a three layer. There's a free man. He's a shadow of God. The slave is as the shadow of the free man. But the king, oh, he is like unto the very image of God. So, the, so, so in the ancient world, the idea of image of God is present. Okay, so Genesis 1 isn't, once again, introducing new ideas. It's playing with existing ideas. So ancient world, like, oh yeah, well, who, who's the image of God? The king is. He represents God's essential characteristic, his wisdom, and he represents his authority and power. And even until, gosh, what century, we had the divine rights of kings. Kings rule on God's behalf. That's well understood in the, in the, in the Western Euro European world. Now we all got democracy on us. We forgot about all this, right? And here, the king is superior to all. He is the image of God. He represents God. Genesis 1 is therefore revolutionary again, a paradigm shifting, sh paradigm shattering by declaring all humans to be made in the image of God. It's like, what in the world? Are you serious? Are you, are you kidding? Okay. Everybody rules. Everybody's a king. Right. Um, and that's what um, uh, Lewis writes about um, in, in for the... For the um, a coronation of Queen Elizabeth on June, on June 2nd, 1953. The pressing of that huge heavy crown on that small young head was a symbol of the situation of all men. C.S. Lewis totally gets this. Humans are kings. Okay. What happens to her? We're all there. No big deal. We're all there. And, and um, uh, on the line with one being a brutish animal and ten being God, humanity is an eight or nine. Elmer Martin's Old Testament the scholar. He's putting it right there. Genesis 1 exalts humanity to this obscenely high level. Okay. And, and then we're going to see the crash. We're going to see the crash and burn. That's tragic. I know there's, I was asked this question recently about worm theology, that humanity is considered worms, that we're low below the dirt. I, I can't, I mean, I can see individuals maybe making that cry. Like, oh, I feel like a dirt, I feel like a worm. But this is, overall, this is not the Bible view of humanity. The Bible's view of humanity is as an exalted creature with incredible powers and creativity, powers of, of empathy and love and compassion, intelligence, and capable, to do, capable of great things. And I mean every single person. Which, which makes the fall so much more tragic. Right? The shrinking and the, and the destruction of the image of God and in, in devolving into corruption. And that's what's coming up next. Question. On Genesis 1. We're going to... Yeah, sorry. sorry, go ahead. So, I mean, if we're just working on Genesis 1, there is no sense of, like, human being as kings full of love and self-sacrifice, right? Not yet. <laughs> not yet. So the thing is, these terms are not yet defined. 
right? So we, we can look back into it and go, oh, rulership. Oh, that sounds like typical rulership. But we're already we're already breaking some some bounds, right? If you're an ancient Israelite walking in the wilderness, you read Genesis one, you'd be thinking, first of all, our God's bigger than Egyptian God. Egyptian God's not even a God. Ha ha. Second, oh, I'm in the image of God. Is that possible? Is that is he serious? I mean, these would be hugely challenging notions for any any person in the ancient world. Okay. Um, so those those are the things that are kind of that that that, that are that are speaking to them. Um, okay. Did I answer your question? I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let me move on. I'm sorry. I have, we have, we're, our pacing is a little quick today because we're going to try to cover Genesis three through eleven, which means we're co covering act, the second act today. Okay. Uh, and I summarized it for you. Uh, we're, we can't look at all the texts, but what I want to do is to dive into a few texts. I want to especially dive into the final one, the Tower of Babel story, which I think is a is the culmination of Genesis three through eleven and sets the stage for Act three. So Tower of Babel story is really the critical one, and it gets underplayed. Um, people don't seem to realize that the pivot of the Bible is at Genesis 11 and 12. You're talking about absolute change in direction. Act 1, creation. Act 2, fall of humanity. At Genesis chapter 12 begins God's response. And that response is Act 3, 4, and 5. It's one thing. So the, so the Bible has a pivot, has a place where directions change. Problem, solution. Solution happens, problem culminates in Genesis 11, solution begins in Genesis 12. The pivot of the Bible is right there. I think we actually talked about that last week, but I want to, I want to emphasize that again. So I want to talk about Genesis 11. But going over this, uh, Genesis 3, humans rebel and are expelled from the garden. Um, that's Genesis 3, Genesis 4, Cain commits fratricide, and Lamech boasts of violent retaliation. We'll take a look at that in a bit. And the, the two stories then frame the development of human culture, which says something about human culture. Okay, it's just, you know it's interesting. It's an interesting idea that the structure is already showing up. Um, God preserves a single godly line from Seth. You know, this Genesis five people talk about genealogies. Well, genealogy isn't are not all created equal. The genealogy from, from in Genesis five um, tracks one single person, Seth. Many many kids. This guy. Many many kids. This person. We're following one single line all the way to Noah. Okay. So we have the, the single godly line idea in Genesis 5. And then God rescues humanity and creation from the corruption of sin and blesses the formation of many nations. We won't have time to look at all, all of those chapters. Um, and then we will look at a Tower of Babel, in which I summarize as God delivers humanity from a totalizing cultural hegemony that co-opts religion for the purpose of empire. Okay, I'll, and I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that in a bit. Okay, but that's the, the progression. Okay, the progression of rebellion and then escalation of sin from violence to massive corruption, corruption final, of individuals to finally corruption of institutions of every sort. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> we have to talk about sin. Sin must be understood within a social context. If we understand, the, if we if we believe, if we argue for a legal context of sin, and see sin as deviation from from established standard, right? You have a way of life, and if you go off that, that's considered sin, and that's what that's how how we generally understand sin. We think in terms of legality. We think it's a moral moral codes, and you violated that code, therefore, you have sinned. Um, I want to. But I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm saying let's let's shift it and see what happens if we take the Genesis context in which humans are are appointed as vice regents to rule on God's behalf. Okay, what then is sin? The sin then is understood as rebelling against authority and an attempt to usurp authority. It's much more. It's relational. This is very abstract. Uh, the, the, our typical understanding of sin is that we are we are in relation to a rule. A a kind of a, a standard in which we're evaluated by that. Um, but I think the biblical understanding of sin is much more relational. It's God is the emperor, you're the king, you're the vice regent, are you going to obey? In the area in which you run your life, since all of us are kings in the sense that we rule our body and our bodies are incredible things, 
can do incredible things. In the area of your mind and in the area that you control, are you going to submit to the rule of God and, and, and establish His rule wherever you rule? And by not doing so and choosing not to do so, you're in rebellion against this emperor. And that's a relational understanding of sin. Of sin. Uh, which I think is a critical. I think this is very helpful to understanding the rest of the Bible. Because this one's always caused problems. That's very impersonal and abstract. Okay. This, you're really getting at the personal nature of this. I'm doing this because in a sense I'm rejecting it. Now you can say, well many people don't really consciously rebel against God. True, but that doesn't change the facto, the fact that their life is not um, um, in accordance with God's will, right? There's just there's no there's no relationship. If you're supposed to be God's vice regent and you don't have a relationship with God, there's a problem. Okay. I also add it makes when the idea of God forgiving sin makes a lot more sense in the Genesis context because like there's this abstract thing. Yeah. Why is God forgiven? It's, 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 it's this is abstract rule. Right. Whereas if it's as if you're rebelling against an emperor, it makes complete sense that the emperor could forgive you. And what does forgiveness mean? Restoration. Reconciliation, restoration. Right? You see, you see the relational understanding, it's a very helpful idea. That if you understand sin this way, then within the concept of forgiveness is reconciliation and a restoration. Whereas this one is some kind of a, you're forgiven from the punishment, kind of a guilt punishment motif, and this is a reconciliation motif. Okay? And, and we, we just heard about Romans last night. If you have this understanding of sin, it shifts you toward the reconciliation idea, very much, uh, uh, very quickly to, to, to the reconciliation idea. Um, to to be forgiven is to be reconciled to the emperor, and to and to establish his rule on earth. Uh, it's all part of that. Okay. Um, we don't have time to get into all of this. I'm sorry. However, I want to point out a couple of things that are important here. Uh, the serpent, you know, you know this story pretty well, I hope. And the serpent was more crafty and, and, and so on. He talked to the woman. Did God really say you must not eat from the tree of the garden? There's a lot of things said here. Um, what I want to touch on is that the rebellion as defined in this passage, um, God says don't eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And the woman Choose to, he chooses to eat it, and the text is very explicit about her motivation. Okay, very explicit. Uh, verse four: You will not certainly die. The serpent said, "The gift of the woman." For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. So, at the heart of the story is a decision that is, it's not a, it's not impulsive. It's not, people read it like, oh, this is an impulse. No, it's not impulsive. This is calculated. There's very good reason to eat that fruit. Okay? You eat that fruit and you will be what? You will be like God. You can do what God does. Okay? Now, this takes us a bit into why is it that only God can know good and evil and humans can't? Um, and the interpretation of this passage depends on understanding the word Hebrew word for, for, know, for knowing, for the word yada, which it's not only means know in the sense of knowledge, but also means know in the sense of experience or um, engagement. If you want to get into Paulani's personal knowledge, you're getting at some of this idea. Um, Adam knew Eve means he has sex with her, yada. Okay, so the word is not obviously not merely the sense of of, of, of mental knowing. Um, so this this passage um, as, as interpreted um, focuses really not on knowing not uh, knowing good and bad. Ra rather, it's focused on the ability to engage with moral questions of good and evil. Okay, what I mean by that is I get to decide what's good and what's not good for human life. And if you want to think of it that way, that's where we're at today, right? Everybody, the, 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 the goal of modernity is every person, every individual is the arbiter 
of what is good and what is not good. We decide, the individual decide. That's this. Now, why shouldn't humans have that power? The text doesn't say, but some arguments have been put forward, which is, if we begin with something like this, um, we, we have imperfect knowledge. And because we have imperfect knowledge, we don't ultimately know what is good and what is evil. But yet we insist on deciding anyway. My favorite example, I think people here have heard it, heard it a, billion, a gazillion times. Um, when, when, the car first, when the internal combustion engine was put in a car when it first came out in the beginning of the 20th century, um, the huge arguments for it, like this will clean the environment. Why? Horse manure. Horse manure. <laughs> It just gets rid of horses. The horses, the roads stink. The high heaven, the car comes along. No more horse manure. It's going to be awesome. A hundred years later, we want the electric car, darn it. Okay? What's the electric car going to do? I have no idea because we, have, we, now, we now recognize the law of unintended consequences. We humans do not have the ability to project out a hundred years, 150 years, 200 years to see the true consequences of our decisions. Yet we go ahead and say, do this and don't do that. This is good for us. This is not good for us. We insist on making the decisions ourselves. Okay, I'm joking the homiletics here, sorry. <laughs> but this is a reality, right? Humans want to decide what's good and evil. God says, no, you don't really have that decision because you don't know enough. That's one problem. What's the other problem with not knowing? Oh, not having good, good you know, knowledge good and evil is this. The moment we start deciding what's good and evil, we will have disagreements about what's good and evil, right? We'll form into parties and argue about should it be government bigger or smaller? Or not, actually not, not really that, but we will form into gangs and groups and we will start fighting against each other, right? Because we, dis we all disagree. So instead of having one creator who says, I have full knowledge, I know how this works. I'm telling you this is good, this is not good. Human says, we all want to decide, and then it just become a big squabble, ever since. Um, the Can the question not be like, why don't God give us the full knowledge? Why doesn't God give us the full knowledge? So we can make a decision. That is a very good question. So, so that's a hypothetical question, and I have to give you a hypothetical answer, since the Bible doesn't answer yeah. that question. Um, I can, I, I, when I say, I always say this is a speculative, the Bible doesn't say. Um, my speculation is that that knowledge is not intended for humans because it would destroy us. And I take that out of the book of Job. The book of Job is insistent on the, the, the knowledge for what prospers life and what endangers life is not given to humans. That humans are given piety. Fear God. That's the beginning of wisdom. That's all you get. You cannot get more than that. You, cannot, you're, you are not given the workings of the world, of the universe, and what will cause prosperity, what will cause disaster. Why? The answer is because we will always choose the prosperity route. And you think that's bad? Wouldn't everybody behave well? Yes. If humans have full knowledge of good and evil, we would always choose to do what is good. And you're thinking, how is that bad? <laughs> how is that bad is that God, and this is one more, I'm still speculating here, um, because God, at least in the book of, Gen in the book of Job, um, makes it clear that he does not want a fair world. A fair world destroys humans. I'll be talking about this on Tuesday, uh, on Wednesday at the, uh, at the Black Hawk, on this very problem, the problem of a just world. Why would a just world destroy humans? Because if I know precisely what I do and what consequences it will have, I will then use that rule to my benefit. Always. Now, the question that Satan had for God in Job, in, in Job chapter 1 is, does Job fear God for nothing? What is piety? What is the basis for Job's goodness? The Satan says, I don't know, it's because he wants the goodies. If we know what prosperous life, what hinders it, we would just want the goodies. And what ends up happening is we become users of God. We use the system, we game it to ourselves. 
and what God would do. God would get a fair world in which everybody behaves well. I don't think that's what God's into. I think God wants something a little more than that. I'm, I'm getting back to the you know, post-resurrection here. I'm sorry, what? I'm thinking the post-resurrection now. Yeah. Presumably, the world then will be fair. Or at least we think we... You mean the eschaton? Yeah. Yeah, but, and, but, and so but, 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 for, that, but for people who have gone through that process, who maintain their... So, so I would say God's in, interest, and this is what Lewis says, God wants to make free sons and daughters who choose to love him. A fair world will not produce that. Okay. In the eschaton, people who've gone through the process were choosing to love God. Okay. And it is not, and that fair world is not. See, okay, no, make, make, maybe I'm, I'm mistaking. Um, the fair world at eschaton is fair because everybody acts fairly. Yeah. The fair world we're talking about here is different. This is a world in which I can, I, I, a fair world in which the moment I do something bad, I get punished. The moment I do something good, I get rewarded. Right. It's the Santa Claus problem. Right. Right. And the kids manipulate Santa Claus. God becomes our tool if we understand precisely how he operates the world. So, knowledge of good and evil is about knowledge about what prospers life and what hinders life. And if that's given to you, you would just use it. And you wouldn't really give two cents worth about care about God. You, have, you, not, you now become God and you can do whatever you want. So, we're not given that. What, we're really, what is really taken here is the decision to make that choice for ourselves without knowledge, underground knowledge, uh, the requisite knowledge. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah. It's, it's, it's highly speculative, I'm sorry. Um, Chelsea, yes. can you talk a little bit more? I no. feel like this is sort of at the heart of everything and I'm struggling to get it. Okay. The, the knowledge, where, where does love come? Where does relationship Precisely. come? Precisely. What does knowledge actually, what is it framed against? Precisely, you're, you're getting at precisely the problem, which is if we game the world, if we understand <laughs> how precisely how the world is run, we, for example, think about the, 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 the you know, we, we use gravity, laws of gravity, we use laws of physics to manipulate and do the things we want. Right? We can send people to the moon. What if we understand how God governs the world? And, and the, that knowledge is perfectly understood. Okay. At that very moment, it stops being relational. God becomes a purveyor of rules. And all I need to, all I need to know is know the, all I need to, know, need to do, get what I want is to know the rules. Then I can get what I want. <laughs> the moment that happens, I don't need a relationship with God anymore. I don't need to love God anymore. I get what I want. And all humans will do this. Okay. We will figure it out and we will manipulate. And the idea of love, the idea of freedom, the idea of relationship dies, withers on the on the on the vine. By giving us that knowledge, which is which the knowledge that we cannot have. And I think Job makes that very clear. You will never know this. Joe never finds out why, why anything happens to him. That's our reality. Does that help? No. I, I, I don't want to delve too much into controversy because it was yeah. a really touchy subject. Yeah. I think sort of the uh, mass availability of contraception yeah. and like the precise way that we sort of understand the reproductive cycle. Yes. Now yeah. sort of gets into this very thing. You yes. start divorcing, mm -hmm. you know, sort of like, you know, um, the, that intimate act from... Mm -hmm. Uh, the, you know, the natural consequence of having children and building a family <laughs> with uh, one person you love. And you divorce those two things, mm -hmm. and people became it for themselves. And they started using it precisely for themselves, and it's divorced from uh, a deep love and relationship. It's fascinating, the discussion yeah, of... Said, you know, in general and right. modern culture. You know, I, so. This is a, maybe a personal journey, as I've been thinking more and more about the issue of, of homosexual marriage. <laughs> What's taken me more and more... <clears throat> It's going to be to develop a theology of sex that leans me more and more toward the Catholic view on contraception, precisely because of this, this issue. So like previously, we don't really think about it very much, and suddenly realize this is a really interesting thing, it's especially on the passage we just looked at, the, the, the be fruitful, multiply, the, the, the sex and the image of God being, being somewhat tight, closely tied together. I think it's a very interesting thing. So I, yeah, I'm still working on that. But I think, I think you bring up a very interesting topic. So, um, any speculation on why this is like a choice in the beginning? Like why why God gives a choice? So speculation <laughs> is choice. That that God gives them one way to rebel. So so think about it. 
if the, the way to rebel is eat this eat this tree. This is tree is called the tree of knowledge of good and evil. What it tells you is this is the tree that says, eat this and you get to decide what is good and evil. I'm telling you it's evil. You by eating it is saying it's good. Right? Which means by eating it you have decided what's good and evil. That's all. Um, it basically says, um, don't eat this. Don't don't kick that rock. Don't walk over there. I'm gonna create some some way for you to express your rebellion. Mm. Okay. I'm gonna live with you. God says, I'm gonna live with you. I'm gonna be in place with you. I'm gonna provide you with <coughs> a great place, a great place of community, everything else. There's only one rule. I'm the master of the garden. I'm the master of this place. Okay. You can have everything you want, but you can't <coughs> violate that one part. We have to have that relationship established properly. So I think that's that command um, mm. serves that function, establishing the relationship of authority and person under authority. Um, I mean, if God didn't give them this rule, then there is no clarity to the relationship. Does that make sense? It's like, well, we're just hanging out, <laughs> right? Oh no, we're not just hanging out. We're, we're not just roommates hanging out in a garden together. There's one person who made the rule, and the rule then for serves a critical function. And then by observing the rule, you, you express a desire to maintain and continue deepen this relationship. And by breaking it, you're saying, I don't want this. Any parallel? I mean, how, how is it different from the Promethean myth, for instance? You mean the, the fire? Bringing out the fire? Yeah. I mean, are there other stories of men rebelling against? Um, so, 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 like, so, Enuma Elish, and, and you know, the, the problem. So, there, the, there's really the problem isn't the same. The problem are with with the gods. Mm -hmm. Right, the, the conflict in the in the myth stories are God stories. Gods are in struggle with each other. Here, the, you to, you, by in Genesis one, by stripping other gods out, the story is really lacking conflict now. Okay, so the conflict goes in a different direction. I'm sorry, I'm saying this talking about this in terms of literary ways, and but it's humans are now the story. The human rebellion is the problem. Um, and so no, it's actually rather rare, mm -hmm. rather unusual. Mm -hmm. right? The Odyssey. I'm sorry? You have the Odyssey. You have the Odyssey. Is that a story of human rebellion? Well, I thought it was, at least in some part. Odysseus wants, it wants to, you know, he's sort of rebelling against the gods. And you mean, you mean he, he, kinda, to, he kinda ticks off the Cyclop, you mean? I mean, I mean he, that he, he thinks, you know, I'm the guy, I, I, I just... Or hubris. The, the yeah, gods yeah. punish hubris. Yeah. So that, but that, but that's very different than any kind of a systemic rebellion. And even then, there's people who like it. Some of the gods like it, like Odysseus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you understand that the the issue um, in in the, in the Greek mythology and ancient Asian mythology is that the conf it's usually conflict with the gods, and and it's always it's always hubris is the problem. Humans getting too big for their britches, and the same thing happened after Hostas, where where gods drown everybody because they're too darn noisy. Okay, <laughs> humans we created them. There's too many uh, Atrahasis, which is the uh, uh, Akkadian uh, flood narrative, in which the gods got mad because humans were noisy, and um, they drowned them. And one of the gods decided to save a particular human, made him a cube for a boat, which is not seaworthy, but okay. So, uh, <laughs> and then the problem is after the humans all drowned, the god says, "Shoot." No more food. <laughs> That's not good. So, so you have these gods that are not sure. also idiots. <laughs> but, the, but the point is, in the ancient world, you don't have the idea of a god being all-knowing. What you have are gods who are capricious, because the natural world is capricious. So don't tick off the gods. That's a fundamental motivation in the ancient world. You know, don't be hubristic. Don't boast of things. Um, what got, what got, what's his name in the trouble was that after he blinded the Cyclops, he yelled out his name, right? And the Cyclops went ahead and got Poseidon on his side, and that's where the whole the whole Odyssey story went on from there. It was more of a one-on-one, -on -one, I'm ticking you off, I'm a badass kind of, kind of, kind of thing, rather than any, any kind of a systemic human rebellion against God's rule. And here, you're really not talking about hubris. Humans are given authority to rule. We're supposed to feel pretty good about ourselves after reading Genesis 1, right? So the, the 
only problem you can't do is don't you shouldn't usurp God's role in taking something that's really designed for Him. That's the only thing. Everything else, go ahead and do it. Rule of the fish, rule of the birds. You're king, go for it. You're queen, go for it. It's a very different mindset. All right, very different mindset. Okay. Sinner's rebellion continues in the next passage in a, in a, in a king story. Um, in the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soils and offering to the Lord, and Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. And Yahweh looked on, with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. And then Yahweh said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. That passage of ruling. You have, you have control over you your instinct and your impulses. You must do something. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go to the field. When they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother and Abel and killed him. Uh, remember what I said about pushing down the uh, the statue of, of Malphodon? Okay. If humans are God's image bearers, okay, what is Cain doing? Cain is trying to kill God. Right? He can't kill God, so he kills the next best thing. Like the story portrays jealousy. Why we? Yeah. Well, wh wh why is he mad? Because God likes Abel better than him. Right. right? So this is this is so, so I'm mad. Okay, I'm mad at you because God likes you better. So I'm gonna kill you to to get to get a who? I'm not mad at you. I'm mad at God. So I'm gonna kill you to get to God since I can't kill God. And since you represent God, fine. I'm gonna get you. Okay. So this is so we have. If we're talking about murderers, um, murder, mur mur fratricide. What we really have is kind of this rebelling against God. Now, once you start with everybody deciding what's good and evil, I get to decide what is good and right. And then if God decides differently from me, I'm gonna be mad about that. I am a person who knows good and evil. I think God should favor my gift. Why, why is it clear why he didn't like him? Yeah, I don't get into all that, but um, uh, Abel, the, the, the text in Hebrew uh, focuses on, um, if you want to look at the min peri, uh, some of the fruits, part of it. It was clearly kind of, here's some fruits, here's part of it. It was not special, it was just kind of a thing, versus fat portions of the firstborn, which is considered delicacy, the best. So Abel brought the best, Cain brought us some, uh, some fruits. So fat portions, the best thing, I don't know how, how today what we call it, well, I don't know, caviar slash, I don't know, I don't know, what's the best Prime food beef. you imagine, huh? Prime beef. Kobe beef? Yeah, so, so Abel brought Kobe beef, and Cain brought a basket fruit, fruit basket. From Got it from Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> that's the difference, okay? That's the difference. So that's what's being conveyed in the storyline. And not surprisingly, I was like, wow. <laughs> really? <laughs> really? Right, gee, thanks. Okay. Now, <laughs> if you do it right, will you not be accepted? He's basically saying, look, you still can change. Is that what he's, that what he's saying? Yeah. Mm -hmm. He said, do it right, you'll be accepted. He's like, we can fix this. But for the king's attitude, is a fun, fascinating attitude. I don't give, I don't really, I'm not really, see, this is, this is, Remember, think original context. Emperor, vice regent. So what is this? This is, um, um, shoot, I lost the word. Because I got the Chinese word in my head. I, this is what, I, what it comes from, teaching too much Chinese. I got the Chinese word in my head, I can't get the English word. Uh, it, you, uh, uh, so vassal sent in... Tribute. Tribute, thank you. Wow, okay, that's just really weird. Okay. Um, they send in tribute, this is a tribute. Right, emperor, vice regent, vassals, they offer tribute to the emperor to say, you know what, you reign, you rule over us, you're, you're like our king kind of thing. So they brought this to him, and Kobe beef, gift, you know, gift basket, you know, flower basket from Walmart, and you're, you're thinking, wow, and he's saying, look, you can fix this, right, you can fix this, but if you don't, you're going to get run over. Okay, your your insistence on deciding what is good and evil is going to run get run over. Because here's the thing, 
God, God reserves the ability to disagree with you on what is good and evil. You can disagree with God. That's fine. Okay. You think that gift basket is good enough. Fruit basket is good enough. God says, not really. This is not that great. Okay. And now Cain's response is, I'm going to get mad. Okay. And because that guy, you like him, I'm going to kill him for you for it. Okay. So this is your result of humans deciding what is good and evil. And you talk about Abel being the first martyr. He died for his faith. I can see it. Right? He killed, he killed, he, Abel was killed because God liked him. Bummer. Huh? Okay. Um, humans become murderers. It's your starting point. That, that decision of good and evil leads to violence. That's what I said earlier. When you, when these people disagree about what is good and evil, they get into all kinds of reasons and and if I decide what is good and evil, you decide what is good and evil, I decide it is good to kill you. Who's to stop me from making that decision? So there, I mean, there's a sense that God limits our knowledge of good and evil to limit our ability to judge. Um, well, we judge anyway, don't we? Yeah. So what happens is, so there's two options. Yeah, yeah. There's two options. One, God can give us full knowledge of how the world works, what would prosper life, what would hinder life. That would then go ahead and allow of people not behaving badly. But what I said was that destroys um, human relationship between God and humans and human and humans. We're, we're really incapable of love. All we do is use God. But if he doesn't give us that full knowledge, it demands that we live in a faith and faith and obedient relationship with him. And if we don't want that, and we rebel, and we say, we want to make our own decision, we're now in a position where we make decisions about what is good and bad without ultimate knowledge. It's like five-year-olds deciding um, tax politicization policy, which is kind of what we do anyway. Okay, that's kind of situation. We are constantly making decisions about things with very limited knowledge. Um, so it seems like they're using the, the phrase good and evil to mean something like the good consequences and the evil consequences of actions. Yeah. Whereas, whereas some might interpret good and evil to mean what is good and what is bad. Oh, you're talking about, so So I'm thinking more, much more, so you're thinking more, um, uh, I guess, with the ontological and I'm thinking more utilitarian? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, very good, very good point. Um, I would argue that both of those divisions are problematic in the sense that um, we are, oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, let me, let me back that up and say that God, by, um, okay, let me, let me back even further. Good and evil in Genesis 1 um, is defined as what prospers life. And we know that because? Because um, Genesis 1, God declared it was good. It was not ever, ever ethical or deontological. Mm -hmm. is always utilitarian. It's always, it produces a space for life to prosper. And God sees the, the prospering of life as being wonderful. So if you want to go with Genesis 1, um, good and evil is, is, is read in those kind, kind of levels. You want to think, get, get us in this kind of, kind of more of an ethical debate, um, maybe more philosophical debates. Um, I, I'm thinking that within the Genesis 1 context, um, Prospering life is the better understanding of good and evil. So you say good for life. Good for life. Yeah, it's good for life versus bad for life. Um, and if you saw that, right, you saw that that the, you know, when her decision about good was defined very much to the it's yummy, looks good, and I gain wisdom as a result. That's what it means to be good, right? It's it's very much. This will help me. This will make me. This is it. It, it, it is utilitarian mm -hmm. um, in that sense. Uh, in, in not not. Yeah, you, you know you know what I'm getting at. Yeah. Um, okay. In between this passage of of Cain's story and his punishment, uh, there is the development of human culture and kind of talk about the whole line, the line of Cain, if you will, the Cain's line, and it's all this 
people doing music and doing stuff. And then it ends with this really bizarre little section. Um, Lamech said to his wives, Anna and Zilla listen to me, wives of Lamech hear my words. I've killed the man for wounding me and young men for injuring me. If King is avenged seven times, then Lamech seventy-seven times. So we have a nice little uh, a fra frame here in which you have the story of Cain and then a person, his, his descendant, referencing Cain, right? And they both have the same theme, which is murder and violence. Now you have two stories about murder and violence, and one is Cain killing Abel, and here now, generations later, you have a descendant who says, I'm really good at doing revenge. Right, that's what the story is about, right? Somebody who wounds me, I killed him. So, not just revenge, I do disproportional revenge. Mm. Right? You hit me, I punch you and knock you out. You scratch me, I kill you. Right? I've killed a man for wounding me, a young man for injuring me. If Cain's avenged seven times, I do 77. I'm way badass than Cain. Right. This is a boast. What is he boasting? He's boasting of his ability to exact vengeance on people. Uh, so, now why bring him into the storyline here, except as kind of a, a symbol of the nadir of the Cain line? This is the, the corruption of the Cain line in terms of violence. We have human culture, yes, and then violence. And, and Lamech is his own protection. Right? Cain was going to be was going to be avenged by God, who was protecting him. Here, Lamech says, "You know, I'm doing it for myself. I don't, we don't need God. We can take God right out of the equation. I'm going to do this for myself." Um, excess, excessive retaliation. Uh, this is um, the result. Um, murder and violence and vengeance um, is the result of people choosing what is good and evil for themselves. That's the natural endpoint that the Bible is saying. You have a trajectory. Rebellion in the Garden of Eden, first murder, develop a human culture, and then circles of violence. Because Lamech, if, if Lamech is not the only person who says this, then what happens? You injure me, I kill you. Somebody says, oh, you kill my, you, you kill my brother, I'm gonna kill you. And just kind of a circle of violence and vengeance and escalating violence is the result of the culture. Any questions on this passage? Okay. So we took, we, we, we're past Genesis 4. We're going to skip Genesis 5. Uh, this is where it seems clear that God uh, preserves a line. Okay, all the way to Noah. Um, and then we get to the, uh, the Noah section. And I don't want to go through the whole thing of Noah except to point out... Um, the sin, the development of sin in Genesis 1, 3 through 11 is es escalating. You begin with taking on the knowledge of good and evil, you go to fratricide, violent retaliation, and then you move on to now utter corruption of humanity and creation. The sin escalates. A couple lines here. Yahweh saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. Okay. Now, people don't, usually don't take this very seriously. They, they somehow think that, oh, that's kind of like our human times. I don't think it is. I actually don't think it is. I think that he is describing something that we have not yet seen. Or we have not, we have not seen in our time. Um, it is that every thought of every human was evil all the time. Think about that. We, we, we don't have that today. You don't think this is a hyperbole? I, I don't think it is. I think. Is this where in the Bible where all doesn't really mean all? Well, he, he was, here, here, because the response, I don't think it's hyperbole because the response is so extreme, right? If you look at the, the response, God regretted he had made human beings on the earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. So, so, so God said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I've created, and with them the animals, the birds and the creatures that move on the ground, for I regret that I have made them. And Noah found favor in the eyes of Yahweh. Which is 
chapter 6, we skip a couple verses. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was now full of violence, which comes out of the Lamech story. God saw how corrupt the earth had become. For all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So humans corrupt and it corrupted the earth. The earth is, the word is shakat. It's a very strange idea. Humans have, are corrupted, they're kind of rotten. And it rotted the earth. Uh, and let me get to that in a bit. Uh, for, so, so God said to those, I'm going to put an end to all people for the earth is filled with violence because of the not showing destroyed both them and the earth. God continues to allow humans to rule over the earth even though humans rebel. Okay, The, the relationship, even though it's broken, the, the humans have the ability to really um, seriously mess up the earth. <laughs> It'll be corrupt. Desecrate. Uh, they can, they, can do, they can do this. And so God's response is, if things are this bad, um, I, have to put, I, have to, I have to wipe this out, but I'm going to start with you, the Noah, and a small group, and we're going to start over. Okay. And so the argument in Noah, I know Noah's story is hev heavily emphasis on judgment, but I think, I think it's right to read it as a salvation story. It is that at some point, if you want to put, describe this, there's no room for human redemption anymore. Okay. No room for human redemption. God acts to change human society in some fundamental ways so that some space can be opened up for human redemption. Some inkling of goodness can come in. And he's going to do that here, and he's going to do it in the Tower of Babel story. Okay. So that's going to be interesting. This is, this is a place where God's going to do something about the complete corruption of human society from Cain to Lamech all the way to mass violence. And you can easily imagine that. A society, if you have, you have a society that, um, well, maybe it's hard for us to imagine it. Uh, living in societies that have been heavily influenced by the Bible, by the Christian faith. To imagine a society that is completely unjust, completely corrupt, uh, completely violent. Maybe like the Roman Empire, that would be a pretty, pretty good place to go to. Okay. Um, bloodthirsty uh, and, and, and cultures um, that revels in status, in power, and in cruelty. And that, I don't know how to make that come to life uh, because we don't live in such a society. We, we complain about this country, I know, but... Let me, let me keep going. We have escalation, and then God comes in to mitigate. God says, okay, we're going to start over with Noah's kid, Noah and his children. And so that's one act. Um, and then we have the final story in Genesis 3 through, through 11, in which the sin escalates again in a different form. Okay? And that's the text I want to spend more time on today. Um, before I do that, any questions on this progression from individual choices to individual murder to excessive violence to complete corruption of human society and finally to this, to, up to the Noah story? Any, any questions? What does corruption really look like? I'm now talking about extreme selfishness and self absorption and very violent. So, well, um, okay. It's a good question. Um, so let me think. The, what God can what, talk about what God condemns. So, so if you want to talk about Canaan as being kind of for God, kind of the epitome of this kind of world. Um, so one of the story in, in Genesis, a man walks into a city, um, and the the town's people come and says, "We must now rape him." That's the norm. That's the cultural norm. The violation of strangers, um, physical, mental infliction of, of pain and suffering on that person for enjoyment. Let's start with that. Okay. Um, and that's considered cultural norm. Um, the sacrifice of children to burn them is considered religious right. That's considered cultural norm. Um, so I guess I'm describing ancient culture that actually existed um, that we today we think, really? Seriously. Um, that God would say, now if all of human society resembled that, 
what would what he what should he do or even better how do righteous how do people who are trying to seek God how do they survive in such a society right there's no room for them so when you get to the Noah story when human society is completely corrupted here's Noah one guy left with his fans with his kids and he and God's thinking they're not gonna make it this is it we ran out of time okay wipe them out start over that's an act of deliverance I don't think it's an act of judgment. I mean, this is an act of judgment. It's both ends. But I think the deliverance aspects are usually under, underplayed in the story. Can I go back to some of the environmental I'm sorry. I'm sorry? I'm going back to some of the environmental comments that you yes. made before. It's also an environmental study. We are going to make sure that the environment survives. Yeah. Animals. Yeah, he, he, he's going he's to deliver a small group. The rest, he's, the, the strange thing idea is that, that that's the part that's really hard for us to understand is that human culture can corrupt Earth, such that he has to wipe out the animals too. <laughs> okay, um, and for us, that's that's something that we don't get very well. Why does my misbehavior means my dog has to die? Right. So we we have this very strong notion of individual responsibility, whereas God in the Bible has hold those two intention, the individual and the collective intention. He will punish people nationally. He does. There's no getting around that. And for us, like, well, that's just wrong. We can't do that. We're individuals. But you know, I would say that the concept of the, of the Western individual hasn't really been around that long. <laughs> okay, this is kind of a, we're very much reading from the 21st century mindset, like, ah, that doesn't work for us. Um, and I, I, I feel bad about that. Um, but the idea that humans have ruled, have rule and authority over creation means that creation participate in human corruption. Like, it's hard to go beyond that. The Bible, that's what, the earth is corrupted and needs to be cleansed, needs to be wiped out. It, it, yeah, I mean, as an ecologist, I could, I could give lots of examples of sites that are so overrun with invasive species, which are uh -huh. based on greed and lack of complete knowledge, and we brought this thing because we thought it would fix this one problem, but by this <laughs> one profit, and now it's right. so taken over that there may be native things there left, right. but as the an ecologist or manager, we like, right. burn the whole thing down, okay. herbicide the whole thing, really? and start over. Oh my goodness, so you, so you're, you're, you're doing the, the NOAA option. It really happens. Pushing yeah. the NOAA option. Land managers, yeah. Oh, really? All the time. All the time. That's awesome. You need, can you give me? Can you send me some instances of this? Yeah. I think I might have to use this. This is awesome. Yeah, I have to email you for that. But my, I think it's Chernobyl. I think about human mistakes and human hubris leaving areas so devastated that nobody can visit for generations to come. They've corrupted the earth, right? What's God gonna do with that? <laughs> right? They just destroyed it. So. Wait, wait, yeah, yeah, good examples. I like that. You guys, you guys actually have the. You guys call it a Noah option. <laughs> we <laughs> don't wipe it all out. <laughs> you nuke it. Option. You nuke it. You nuke it. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. what they say. Should be nuke it. They nuke it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So let's go to the last one. I, I think this is a fascinating story. It's a short little story, eleven verses, um, but but just just fascinating. Um, Chile. Nine verses, sheesh. Um, now the whole world has one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and make them bake them thoroughly. They used bricks instead of stone and tar for mortar. And then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But Yahweh came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. And Yahweh said, if as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So that Yahweh scattered them from over all the earth and they stopped building the city. That is why it's called Babel because there Yahweh confused the language of the whole world. From there, Yahweh scattered them over the face of the whole earth. Okay. The major theme here is uniformity, right? Sameness, oneness, and God opposing that. Uh, let me begin by pointing out that this, you notice the title of the slide doesn't say the Tower of Babel. It says the Tower of Babylon. Now why? Uh, first of all, this whole, this, this story happens at Babylon. Playing in Shinar, Shinar refers to the region of South Mesopotamia, in which Babylon is the major city. So it happens right there. And second, that place is called 
Babylon. What I mean by that is this. The Akkadian word for Babylon, Bab Elu, means the gate of the god. Biblical Hebrew, Babel, or Babel, refers to the capital city of Babylon, or the land of the Babylonian Empire. Everywhere else in the Bible, Babel is translated Babylon. Except in this instance. And I think one in chapter 10. They translated Babel. I'm not sure why. I'm not entirely sure why. Maybe, maybe somebody can tell me why, why it happens. Um, but Babel is Babylon. The Hebrew word, there's no distinction whatsoever. Between, ba between Babel and Babylon. It's exactly the same word. Um, I think they think it's, they call it ba Babel because maybe it's too early to be Babylon? I don't know, maybe some kind of historical thing? All I know is this, if you, if you ask an Israel, ancient Israelite, oh, that place is called Babel, they're gonna go, oh, that's Babylon. They wouldn't have any thought of anything else other than Babylon. This is a story that is critiquing Babylon. Whether if Moses wrote, wrote this in, in the wilderness, if they're heading to Canaan, Babylon is the major cultural center, or if they're in the Babylonian exile, and the story takes its final shape there, and you're a Jew sitting in Babylon, and you're reading this story, the Tower of Babylon, you're reading the story as a critique of this place you're at. Okay. So, I, I think there's a problem in translation. I think it's problematic. Um, by changing the Babel, we miss the point that's actually talking about Babylon. Um, Wait, so you're saying the translators decided it should be Babylon? Yeah, I think it's traditional. They, they, they follow tradition and call Tower of Babel. And what they should have just done is Tower of Babylon and save us all the trouble. <laughs> Instead, it's like, oh, it's Babel. Oh, it's Babel's just Babylon. It's the same Hebrew word. There's zero difference whatsoever. If you look up Babel, you'll see Babel, you will see Babylon everywhere else, except here in the one that's played Genesis 10. You mean the translators here in Genesis 10 write Babylon? Yes. Depends on but which one, NIV or whatever. Everywhere you see the same Hebrew. So heavy Hebrew is always Babylon. Mm. Mm. Because that's what the word means. It means refers to Babylon. But we don't know why they went with Babel, which lose, causes you to, freak, to not realize the connection. Yeah, the story makes a lot more sense then. Doesn't it? All of a sudden, it makes sense. Uh, it that's why I always start. This is the story not of Tower of Babel, it's the Tower of Babylon. Okay? You critique Egypt, and now you gotta go to critique Babylon. So, where, 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 do, uh, where does the English word for Babel come from that day? When you're just uh, that we're just speaking Babel, but a child is speaking, they're speaking Babel, they're speaking. Jewish. That's B A B B L E, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right, right. It sounds really simple. Right, and that's, it, I think that's a, uh, what's the word? I don't know where B-A-B-B-L-E comes from. Uh -huh. I, can't, I can't tell you. It actually comes from Babylon. It might come from this. So I, my guess is this. This is guess. I haven't looked into that. I should have. My guess is the King James Version went with Babel. Because they, in their mind, think, well, that's too early for the, for the founding of Babylon. Yeah. So historically, this must precede that. So it's a place called Babel. So they called it that. Because Babel actually looks more like Hebrew. Right? Babel. Mm -hmm. It looks comes right out of that. It's like, oh, Babel. If you look, at the, look at the transliteration. Babel. Babel. So it actually, they, they, they transliterated the Hebrew. Other places, they translate Babylon because that comes out of the Greek. The Greek name for ba Bab Elu is Babylon. Or the Akkadian is Bab Elu. Right. So, you know, so, so you see that they, they, the yeah, so I don't know where the word English word Babel comes from. But here's the, here's the thing, Babel doesn't mean confusion. Babel means gate of the god, Bab Elu. So why does the, the, the Hebrew people say it's called Babel because their God confused the language of the world? Because the word confused is Balel. So you get it? It's called Babel because God Balel, the language. It's kind of a near pun. He's not really saying Babel actually means confusion. It just, it kind of sounds like Babel. That's all, all, that's all the author's doing, okay? He's not saying Babel means confusion. But because English, we get Babel, therefore we think Babel means, or means confusion. 
So we're confusing all kinds of language problem here. Okay, there's no, the Babel doesn't mean confusion in Hebrew or in Akkadian. No city would call themselves Babel. <laughs> we're confusion. No, we're gate of the god. Okay, it's a it's a it's a religious name. We are religious people. Okay, we we worship our god and and and. Um, and, and you know these Elu, right? like Elohim, same <laughs> roots. Who's the god of Babylon? Uh, Marduk. Marduk. Marduk is the, is the main god of Babylon. Yeah. But he has a, he has a coast. He has a whole pantheon. Yeah. If you read the Numa Ish, Marduk is the one who kills Tiamat, uh, the the crazy um, uh, er, 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 ancient god. Kills her with a, a gang, kind of a Justice League, I guess, a gang of them, <laughs> and takes on t Tiamat, wipes her out, and then cuts her into pieces and creates heaven and the earth, and then uses bits of her to create humans. So we have divine spark, and that's kind of the, the, the ancient creation myth that, uh, that comes out of this. Um, but Marduk, of course, is the hero. So, um, any question on this? So, so what's the because of the study? I'm sorry. Why is it the because of the study? I'm getting there. Okay. Okay, you're, you're moving me forward. I appreciate that. I just want to make sure we understand what we're talking about Babylon. Now, <laughs> nah, that's not what we're this. Uh, just, just as a point, the Lower Mesopotamian civilization. Um, if you look at the dates. Early dynasty, 2900, 2300, Akkad, 2300, 2100. We're talking easily, easily, a thousand years before Moses. A thousand years. Okay? Long history of culture, tradition, religion. It is the place you want to go to everything that is that is great and powerful and cultural. And, and, and you know, we'll talk about the great civil architecture, the great art, the cultural flourishing. You're going over there. The South Mesopotamia, you're talking about Ur, you're talking about Khan, you're talking about Babylon, you're talking about uh, um, 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 uh, Nineveh. Okay, the, the great cities over there, they're the fantastic ones, okay? Uh, epic poetry, Ashwa Sagogam, which I've already mentioned, um, they are very focused on the study of divination, figuring out what God wants. <gasps> knowledge of good and evil, knowledge of what prospers life, and systematic polytheism with organized cults, cultists. What I mean by that is, they are. They they do a lot of large processions, annual festivals, to celebrate, worship God, and codify their their their, their worship of the gods. Very religious people. Okay. That's interesting. But also a very technocratic society. I mean, how that is code. Yes, the law. But, but what's interesting about that is that that law code was written at the temple toward the gods. Right. It was saying to the gods. We're pretty good. Look at us. We have these codes. So even that is very religious. The Hammurabi's code is um, Hammurabi's code is is, is, a, is um, related to to the divine. Um, has a religious impulse behind it. Um, well, I mean, in general, the sort of the distinction between religion and society that we have in the U.S. Not much one. There isn't much of an extinction, extinction of distinction at all. Right. Yeah. In, in, the, in the old in the old days. No. Yeah. And so we're getting back to this then, is if Genesis is not written to avoid, but into competing worldviews and cultural imperatives and ethnic competition, then it would be silly, absolutely moronic for Moses not to write a creation myth that critiques other cultures and to say, our worldview is the right one, theirs is wrong. So he will, he will go after the Egyptians, he will go after the Babylonians, because those are the two main ones nearby. Our creation myth is distinct from theirs for these reasons. And we already talked about some of that earlier. Okay, so what is the critique? Well, first of all, if it's about Babylon, how are we to understand this tower? Uh, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They use bricks instead of stone and tar for mortar. And they say, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches the heavens. You notice the emphasis on what? The emphasis on technology, superior technology. We have bricks and we're gonna use it instead of stone and tar instead of mortar. Oh, tar for mortar, sorry. Uh, and we're going to build a city and a tower. Um, Akkadian building inscriptions hail the achievements of great kings and they emphasize making of bricks. In fact, the modeling of the brick, first brick, was regarded as an important rite with a ceremony. So here, here's an interesting part of it about Enuma Elish. Let us build a shrine whose name should be called. Whoa. What happened to the, the word? Where did it go? 
<laughs> All right, forget that. Lo, a chamber for our nightly rest. Let us repose in it. Let us build a throne, a recess for his abode. On the day that we arrive, we shall repose in it. When Marduk heard this, brightly glowed his features like the day. Hoo hoo! Construct Babylon, whose building you have requested. Let its brickwork be fashioned. You shall name it the sanctuary. And the Anunnaki applied the implement. For one whole year, they molded bricks. They spent a year building bricks. Just to build Babylon. Okay. When the second year arrived, they raised high the head of Esaglia, equally Apsu. These are names of gods. And having built a stage tower as high as Apsu, they set it up. Apsu is the heavens. They built it as high as the heavens. Did you catch that? These echoes? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they set up in the abode for Marduk, Enlil, and Ea. And in their presence was seated in grandeur to the base of Eshara as its horns looked down. Um, okay. Towering, reaching the heavens, made of bricks. This is something that was recently, not recently found, but recently pieced together. These rocks were split apart, and they assembled these actually, you say, wait a minute, this is actually one piece, and they pulled it together, um, and you can find, find it in the, in the data there if you're interested. And it actually says this. That's a Menanke, this, this is a ziggurat, this is a, uh, a religious uh, tower uh, at Babylon. Ziggurat of Babili, the house, the foundation of heaven and earth, the ziggurat in Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and my, the base I filled in to make a high terrace. I built their structures with bitumen and baked brick throughout. I completed it, raising its top to the heaven, making it gleam bright as the sun. Right? The Babylonians emphasized two things. We use bricks. Oh. And we build them tall. <laughs> right? So now when you read this, this is their propaganda. This is Babylonian propaganda. And when the Jewish writer, he's like, he just throws those ideas right into his text. This is what they say. This is what the Babylonians say. Babylonians go around saying, we're using bricks. Look how strong, look how powerful. We got some serious, serious technology. And we build them a tower that reaches the heavens. They're using Babylonian um, a vocabulary, Babylonian views of their tower, and he's just importing it right in here. Okay. And he's going to critique it. Okay. City with a tower. Uh, so what is this thing? Well, people are pretty much in agreement that this is a, this is a ziggurat. Okay. Um, apparently, Antimanenki was here. This is the enormous ziggurat of Babel, which is possibly identified with Tower of Babel. Who knows? Antimanenki means temple of the foundation of heaven and earth. The foundation measures more than 300 feet square. Some people say it reaches height as 300 feet as well. Pretty tall. Um, these are people over there. So this is pretty wide, how big this thing is. And there's people over there. Those are two persons. Here's actually a one that's left over. You can see this really well. It's an area view of the ziggurat of Ur-Namu at Ur, in southern Mesopotamia, the superior, uh, superior, uh, Sumerian capital. Um, it's to dedicate to the moon god Nana. And you can see the structure of this thing. Right? You can see the major platform with three stairways going up. And then on top, there's a temple complex, which has been destroyed. But you can still see the foundation. Um, that's an aerial view. This is a better view. This is a front, front view. You can see the, the stairs going this way, straight, the stairs going straight up, and then the temple, temple uh, compound up there. Um, this is straight up. Okay. That's still the. This is yeah. This is real. Actual, this is a real exist. one. So exists. Yeah. If we go to Ur, you can go see it. Um, somebody mentioned recently. Well, a friend of mine who saw this picture, he said um, his son was in Iraq, and they actually go and visit and take pictures of this. This is still there. You get the idea, right? This is a stairway to heaven. Mm -hmm. hey, God's up there. Still there. Still there. God's up there. Climb up and walk up there. You see the gods. Okay. This is what they're doing. Um, Led Zeppelin comes into play, yes. Um, this is a reconstruction, um, what it might look like. And we have preserved this part, and then the top part is obviously multiple levels getting higher and higher, closer to the gods. Okay. Um, the, way, the reason I show you all this is to convince you, and I think there's a, bit, there's a consensus, that this verse 3 is talking about Babylonian ziggurats, or some kind of a Mesopotamian ziggurat. And reaching to the heavens is a... Is, is marking this building as a religious building. This is not some other thing. This is about God and religion. Not the World Trade Center. Not the World Trade Center. <laughs> Absolutely. Not the World Trade Center. Okay. Now, 
This is what I'm going to do. It's sort of disappointing because to me this seems like a great critique of just science and technology. Yes, but it's not. It's superstition. Right, but it's actually religious. Yeah. So you're like, okay, what is the critique then? If these people are not violent, there's anything about violence, mm -hmm. they're, just, they're just worshiping their gods. What's the problem here? So if you look at so we should figure what the critique is. So there is a problem with this, which is why would God be upset if people are building a tower and a temple? Um, the answer traditionally has been, this, so there's, there's a variety of people saying different things, and I'm going to tell you what I think in a bit. People are arguing that, for example, this is the invasion of the heavens. That they building the tower to the heavens invaded. That sounds completely wrong to me. But the invasion of heaven is wrong because it's like there's no violence against God. The Babylonians themselves don't consider you know, they're building it to honor Marduk, not to invade Marduk. They like Marduk, right? Mar they want Marduk's favor. That, that idea of invading the heaven doesn't make any sense. The idea that hubris, that we can go to the heavens and build a place where humans can visit God and visit the heavens, that's hubristic, possibly, but then we have, you know, the temple complex. The, the, the Jerusalem that gets built in the Bible, in which God and you know, the, the high, high priest goes in there and Moses talks to God. I don't know. It's, it's, it's not in the text. So here's what I'm proposing. I think a few other commentators, not many, we're definitely in the minority here. There's a whole bunch of views on this one, okay? Uh, but I think the one that makes the most sense is to simply take it and connect it to the next verse. What is the critique? The critique is that a Babylonian religion is not about God, it's about making a name for themselves. It's a critique of their co-option of religion for their own humanistic purposes. Right? Why are we building this tower? Is it to get to know God better? No. We make a name for ourselves. We get famous. Why? That way, we won't scatter. We create a religious edifice. Everybody says, ooh, they have that. God is with them. God bless Babylon. God bless America. God bless Babylon. So what does that mean? It means we should stay together because Babylon, this is where it's at. This is the place that is honored and respected and blessed by the gods. And God is with us right here. Okay. It seems like, like if the Babylonians make a, make, make a name for themselves, yeah. and they also make a name for their God. Sure, that too. But, but, the, but the point is, the salute, but the goal. Nothing, does a, it doesn't say that, right? right. It, it, you might say, yeah, Marduk is being made famous, but that's not the motivation. The motivation is for themselves. But why? Even more importantly is the last part. So that we don't scatter. Okay. We, we, we want people to join us. We want this group to stay together. We want a kind of a cultural hegemony, if you will, where we have the same religion that really ties us all together. It's what Constantine did um, when he converted to, to Christianity. He said, wow, 60% of, 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 of the Roman Empire, probably didn't have a poll, but he's like, a lot of Christians in the empire. Let me become a Christian. Now I unite the empire. We are not all, we, we're now a Christian nation. Okay? We use religion to serve political ends. That's been done throughout history. Okay? Everybody does this. Every empire is like, okay, we have a disparate group of people. People want to splinter off a different direction. How do we pull them together? We need religion, damn it. Let's okay. find one that will everybody tie everybody together. They're talking about it. Apparently, so there's one guy I met in China who's saying they're doing the same thing in China that the Chinese communist leaders are talking about whether to officially recognize Christianity because they think that Christianity will provide stability and, and an antidote to, to the kind of um, extreme cruel capitalism that's happening in China right now. They need, they need the balance of the Christian bomb so that business people can run and do their thing and you'll keep people calm and they won't rebel and they won't get so upset and maybe or restrain some of the excesses of capitalism. They're talking about this. Okay? That's what the Bible is critiquing. Okay? What we have here is no longer violence or individual evilness. What we have now is the co-option of the religious impulse. It used to be, I do well, but yeah, this is like, oh, maybe there's a God out there that's going to get me. But what happens is, if this God is now subservient to the empire-building humanistic impulse of, of humans, then you can use God to justify anything, right? You can use it to justify naked aggression. 
You can say, God has called us to invade Egypt and let us go. And then we go, well, let's go and invade that place. And um, that's not hypothetical. That's precisely what they say. That's precisely what they say. So, um, this is the age of empires, and, and 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 God is now the religion is now the 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 the, the plaything, the tool of the, of the empire makers. Um, how is that then contrasted with uh, the Exodus? I mean, how how do we understand that? Okay, this is a very good question, and and so we'll have to get there. Because we're not there yet. But what we have, what we have here is complete cultural hegemony. We want everybody to unite under us. We we are the greatest culture that's ever been, and the most blessed by God that's ever been. Maybe Babylonian exceptionalism. I'm I'm being really unnecessarily unnecessarily provocative. I don't know why. Um, maybe because it ticks me off. But that 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 the American civil religion is pretty much this story right here. Um, but. God is on our side. God bless us. And therefore, we should make everybody like us. Right? This, you, you should justify any kind of thing you want. Um, okay. Uh, now think about this in Moses' time. Or think about this when you're living in Babylon as a Jew. And the psalm says, By the river of Babylon we wept and wept and wept. What are they thinking in this storyline? They're thinking... Those Babylonians, they are so religious. They got their gods going and they're worshiping up there and they're using it to justify wiping everybody else out because they can all become like us. Right? We're going we're gonna to destroy all other cultures because we're the superior ones. So uh, if we think about this, it's not from people's intention but from God's intention. This seems good thing. You can't allow people to do so. Uh, so. So here's the question, right? So what does God think about this? Coming up in verse 5. Right? So this is what the humans want. The humans are using... So this is... The, the narrator is telling you what the Babylonian religion is all about. Their cultists, their worship, their piety is really about naked aggression under the veneer of religiosity. And God is going to come down and say something about this in verse 5. What does God think? And there's tremendous irony here. Okay, I just love this. Okay, they build a stairway, it reaches the heavens, and God actually came down. Just, I think that's hilarious. The storyline is wonderful. The, the word Yarrah, it's like, God's like just taking the steps and coming down. You're going to build this darn thing? And it says, we're going to meet God, and in, in, in reality, they don't really care about the God at all. Right? That's what that's what the text before is saying. And God actually shows up and gave them exactly what they say they wanted, but not what they really yeah. wanted. Okay. Um, and I this one I'm gonna go a little homiletic on you guys, sorry, or maybe even, even a bit of reader response. Um, we invoke God to bless our plans. Oh, Tower of Babylon. <laughs> okay. And we, we invoke God no interesting. We invoke God. Very sorry. Oh, okay, there. Yeah, I was like. Oh. We in, we invoke God to bless our plans, and sometimes God might actually show up. And maybe that's sometimes the last thing we actually want. <laughs> Just the thought. So what is God's assessment? God's assessment is that they're one people speaking the same language. Uh, Why doesn't he just break the temple? Why does he have to do the language thing? Let me, let, let, good question. Uh, let me first of all change the translation of NIV into something I think that's more appropriate. Um, that thing that fits better. You can possibly, grammatically, you could read the NIV thing, but I think this is a better interpretation. And many, um, many commentators goes with this one. I think it's, it's more correct. It's not that nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them, but that there will be no net limits to what they plan to do. Okay. Which I think is a much better translation, not only grammatically, but also makes sense. Which is, once you begin to co-op religion, you can use it to justify anything. That's God's assessment. 
and that's the last thing we want. Okay? We, we don't want that thing. If you have culture hegemony with divine sanction, there's no resistance, there's no limits to what you can do. So in other words, there's no limits to their ambition. To their ambition. It's not saying that they can do everything and make the world a perfect, peaceful, wonderful place. No, they're saying that at all. It's saying they're saying there will be no limits. They want everything. They can do anything they they will, like they will plan to do anything they want. They will see no. They will recognize no no limitation to their power. Even though there is. Well, there definitely is. Yeah. But they they will recognize no 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 limit no limits. <laughs> Sorry, where did you get that translation? Um. I, I not, not just me. Gotcha. Um, I, no, no, no. Um, there's a, a, let's see now. Which commentator? Oh shoot! I have to get you. I have to get you the source on that one. Um, a, a couple of commentators go 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 with this one. This is the NIVs. Uh, many other commentators say that doesn't. That's not a good one to translate. And I used to know the know the real reason very well, and now I apologize. I've forgotten it. Um, but I can look it up again later. We can look it up. I can show you why I think this is a better translation than the other one. But, but it's a commentator's translation, not a particular. It's not. NIV. No, no, it's a commentator's translation. Yeah. You will see in multiple commentators they will talk about this that this is the right sense that you want to go with. Yeah. Um, you should take a look at ESC, see, see what it says. I don't know. Which ES, one? ESV? It's the same. Is it the same? Uh, an, an nothing they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Oh, that's too bad. Okay. All right. Okay. The solution to the problem of the search for uniformity and conformity and hegemony and then power and, and the endless power, um, unlimited power, is to confuse their language. Okay. Now here, this is really interesting. They confuse their language, they can't understand each other, and they scattered. So let me ask you this. What was their unity based on? Language, right? Their uniformity was based on language. And the moment they had different languages, they stopped cooperating. So that's, I think that's a critical, critical understanding of human unity. Human unity is almost always dependent on uniformity. Okay? People who truly like each other, who are really, really different from each other, are rare. Okay? Groups of people who can really work together, there's generally some kind of uniformity that allows them to work together. So some kind of eth similar ethnicity, similar religion, similar social kind of background. I mean, I don't know, I'm, I, maybe I'm asking, look at your friends who you hang out with. What are they like? Or how do you decide to make a friend? You meet a person, you click. What is that clicking based on? Similarity of, usually based on similarity of interest, similarity of culture, similarity of background, something like that. So we like what is like us because we love us. We love me. I love me. Right? That's the starting point. I, now we can get to the point where we can start appreciating differences, I'm sure. But the starting point is that. And if you talk about large groups of people, you better have a lot of similarities. Otherwise, it's really hard. Okay? Really hard to put things together. So, God is really critiquing them in some ways. He's saying, look, their unity is based on language. The moment I stop that, they'll fall apart. The moment I become a little different, they'll fall apart. They will not be able to stay together, and they, and they aren't. And if you look at today, this is the world as it is today, where we're riven by ethnic, language, cultural differences, and we fight each other like crazy. Charles, very difficult to follow. Yeah. Look at the text. So the first uh, bit seems uh, very practical and, and, and sort of prospering of life, good for settling, good for life. Yeah. Right? Wait. Uh, the, 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 as people moved eastward. They yeah, yeah. Land. They settled there. Yes. So in that sense, there is a sense of good for. This is the earth, and this is good for life. Let's settle here. Yeah. I mean, to go back to Genesis one and the good for. Evil. Right. 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 So it's good for it. And then they said, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly, which again seems good for, useful. Yes. Form, function, brilliant. <laughs> right. And, and it's to reach the God, so it's pious, it's religious, relational. absolutely, yeah. So those narratives seem good. Yes. Build a city, 
build us a city, you, you sort of get worried a little bit. Yeah. But it's hard that we say, uh, <laughs> otherwise we will be scattered. It all seems great because we want to be together again yes. in that sense of community and relational. And then you suggested that all of that in itself was good, but it was actually not in service of the God, but in yeah. service of empire. And right, right. And, and which, which takes, which if you understand this is a Tower of Babylon, it begins to make all kinds of sense. Mm. Mm. All right. If you just at some random city, okay, we don't get this. But this is this is Babylon. Mm. This is the major cultural center of the, of the ancient world. This is Israel's eventual arch enemy. Okay. This is Babylon. Mm. This the, they are a conquering they people. Judah, right? They destroy Judah. They Assyrian, the, the other one destroys Israel. They like to conquer people. They like to make everybody the same as them. But not in, is that sort of authoritarian or in, in the sort of American way of we are rich and happy and everyone looks Should be like us, yeah. Yeah, but the question is, are, but the, back, back, the problem back then is that they actually go ahead and invade people to make them like, them, like us. Right. They, have, they have this, God is on our side. So, like, I don't know, the, we, we, have a, we have a responsibility to share our culture with these poor backwards people in Canaan. <laughs> the Judah, Judahites. Mm -hmm. Their religion is so off, they believe this weird creator God named Yahweh. Fine, we should, we should disabuse them and have, help them worship Marduk and enjoy our architecture and our technology. They don't like being like us. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but my surprise really yeah. is God's sort of weird response in intervening through language. Yeah. Uh, what's the problem here? Is it that yeah. they're setting up empire or is it that they're making everyone in their image? What is I, I, I think both. I think both. And I think what, what's interesting about this is that, so let, let, me, let me move on quickly uh, about how this plays itself out, which is the creation of nations is something that God intends, and we don't have time to argue for that from chapter 10. Um, that God actually intends the creative nations, and then because the creation of nations also provides the space in which God to provide one single nation, and that's next time. We're gonna talk about Abraham. So this is so you're asking all the great questions because the, how does the storyline work? The storyline now takes us to rebellion, to humans' a tendency to 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 become to love only a self and want to conform, and and then co-op religious impulse into it and God splinters them and then creates a single nation to come and then bless the nation. That's next week, next time, right? So that's what, how the storyline is moving. And eventually you want to think about in terms of this one of the many uh, a conundrum, this tension, eventually God's going to say, I'm going to establish my rule over all of this. Is all of this will have one culture or multiple culture? Right? And just as a hint, if we go to but the, the, um, the Pentecost story, everybody talks about this as being kind of the anti-power of Babel. Right. People usually miss out on the, I think I mentioned this in this group already, they don't mention the fact that the power of Babel is actually not reversed. There's no reversal of what happens here. They don't speak the same language. The difference in languages main, is maintained, everybody hears their own speech. Yet they're unable to communicate because of the Holy Spirit. So what's interesting about the new kingdom of God that gets inaugurated at the Tower at the Pentecost is not that we all unite and become one people and start speaking the same language, but that the, the Tower of Babel situation stands. Different culture, different nation, different languages maintain itself, but we're going to unite on a different basis, not on similarity language, but one spirit and one Lord. And this reunification of the peoples, not based on similarity, but based on oneness of God, that is going to speak powerfully to them. Look at the United Nations, anything but united. They're going to, that the human world is riven by differences. The kingdom of God is united with differences, celebrating differences. I think that's at the heart of these two comparisons, to, to these two, two, two passages, and how they compare. So, I think uh, the big picture, so my other thing is that that was why it was called Babel, so then is that a new word? What, what's the no, it's Babylon. That's why it's called Babylon. Babel. But doesn't it only make sense if it's Babel? No. So that's why it's called Babylon. 
because God there balal the language. Okay, where's balal? Right there. Confused. B That's the play. That's the play. It's B B L versus B L L. Babel versus Babel. So it's called. So it's not Babel like Babel in English, but it's called Babylon because God Balal. Balal. Right. Okay. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, that's what it's called Babylon. So now going back to it. Uh, um, yeah. So sort of the sense of community, the sense of building, but the sense of building temples. Mm -hmm. Are those things in themselves being critiqued, or is it just the use of Babylonian? Equals to yeah. Build empire. So I don't think so. I mean I don't think so. I think I think the problem is right here, right? So that we may make a name for ourselves, although we be scattered over the face of the whole earth. That it's clear that their religious edifice serves the function of unity. I think that part is clear, which means we're using God for something. I think that if if we're if we're completely clear that a tower that reaches the heavens is the ziggurat. And I think we have really good textual evidence that, that people are going to go, yeah, this is, this is what Babylonians themselves say about their religious building, their ziggurat. Then we're really saying ziggurat and autonomy for the entire cultist, their, their religious apparatus. Your religious apparatus is really all about serving your own goals, which involves cultural unity and uniformity and a desire to keep people together. We don't want people to scatter out and be different from us. Maybe you're going to get to this shortly, and I don't want to steal your thunder, but there's an interesting um, uh, play on words again coming up in uh, okay. 11, you know, where it says, like, uh -huh. we may make a name for ourselves, right. let's do this, and then yeah. God God's called make Abraham it. out of the land of Ur, right. which is in the same place. Babylon, right. and he says, I'm gonna make a name I will you. make a name yes. for you. Not today, that's for next week, next time. Yeah, but so absolutely right. Sort of like, yes, yeah. absolutely right. So Genesis 11 and Genesis 12 is the pivot. Okay, and the one of the many, the tension of the one of the many is going to is going to is going to get more intense because now God creates a kingdom, and actually creates a single culture. Okay, so what is the relation between this one and the many, and that really gets resolved only in the New Testament. Okay, which is it? But this is really the big big question: How do you use a single kingdom to bless a nation, the people that's completely scattered, and 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 in what way would that blessing come about? You know, the Old Testament writers actually I think thought it's going to be an Israeli hegemony. Israel will rule the nations as a way of establishing the blessing. Which that didn't, that's yeah <laughs> that didn't go that didn't go right. But okay, um, enough of that. Um, any other questions? I think we're we're done for the day. Other questions? Okay. Wow, I think I ended almost on time. <laughs> Let me pray for us. Um, Father, your word is rich, and, and every time I look at it, there's just more. That's more connections, more, and, and you and you critique um, in such profound ways about who we are. You you know so much about who we are. You you made us, and, and our kingship, our our creativity, our power, the way we reflect who you are, and then, and then our tendencies for violence, for loving ourselves, for using you for our own purposes. Um, you, you alone know what is good and evil. You know what prospers and what does not. Um, and what we pray for is the humility to recognize that, um, to be in that loving and yes, obedient relationship with you. Hope us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.